Good morning, everybody. Shabbat Shalom, all my Hebrews and my Shalomi homies. Um, <clears throat> we are in Leviticus 7 and 8 this morning. Waikra 7 and 8. There are literal sun showers right now. Um, it just rained on this side of the creek. Just a little shower on this side of the creek, but not on that side. Cause it's almost like Florida. I have stood on the yellow line in the middle of a road doing construction in Florida and had it raining on one side of the road and not on the other side of the road. Cause, you know, how you know when it's 2 p.m. in Tampa? When it starts raining. How do you know when it's 2.30? When it stops raining. Um, every day. Florida weathermen have the easiest job in the world. I'm on a tangent here. I don't care. Yeah, it's going to be hot and sunny today with uh, scattered thunderstorms between 2 and 4 o'clock and a uh, chance of hurricanes. The end. <laughs> I'll also tell you this. This actually, uh, I don't know, is maybe a little bit more <laughs> real than all of that. But uh, normally I stand and read y'all. I'm sitting this morning. My back is killing me. So... Uh, if you could keep that covered in prayer, that'd be great. It's been out for about a week and it's not shown any signs of getting any better. And uh, we have a mission to Florida coming up pretty quick. So if you're interested in the Florida mission, bearindependent.com slash mission, or just go to bearindependent.com and uh, just click the missions tab. I need a few things uh, with that. I need somebody to pick somebody up from the airport in Destin, Florida on uh, the afternoon of the 10th and to drop them off on the evening of the 12th. A couple other odds and ends. So if you're interested in participating, just go to bearindependent.com, click the missions tab, or you can email me, uh, NTX, November Tango X-Ray, Mag, Mike Alpha Golf, NTX Mag at gmail.com. And uh, that's always down in the description as well. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, Leviticus 7 and 8. We're in the scriptures. If you're like, what book is that? Just go to the YouTube search bar and put in Bear Independent Bible. I have a video on that. So here we are. We're in Leviticus. Remember, we just got done uh, reading through Exodus. And the first half of Exodus, we have the father bringing his people out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of, out of Egypt and building a testimony with the Hebrews. And then he sets as a covenant for all of our generations, an everlasting covenant, Passover and Matzah, which we just got done celebrating. By the time you see this, it will have been over for a week, but we just got done celebrating. And it's tremendous, right? And we do this in remembrance of. Does that sound familiar? We do this in remembrance of for all your generations. This is uh, one of these things that the modern Christian church tells us, no, that's all done away with. Is it? It's actually not because A, the father says, you'll do this for all of your generations, right? And so if we believe in Messiah, we have to believe in the father, right? Because Messiah himself says, I and the father are one. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's one that uh, you don't hear bandied about the modern Christian church. Keep commandments. Whose commandments? Are my commandments, says Messiah. And I and the Father are one, right? Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord Yahweh Sabaoth. I change not. So yeah, when he says do this for all your generations, he means it. And then Messiah backs that up when he says until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away from this Torah, the Torah, the instruction, the law. And so we come out of that in Exodus where they're doing that. The people come out of Mitzrayim and they find themselves wandering in the wilderness. Um, they actually come up on the promised land and they rejected it. They're like, yeah, nah, whatever. So they had to wander around for 40 years for all, so all the people who rejected it would die off, right? And so here we have, we come through that in Exodus. The second half of Exodus is talking about how to build the temple, okay? They get the temple built, they, and uh, cover the, all the poles will be of acacia wood, and cover that with poles, and all the sockets will be of silver, and it will be this cubits high, and this many, and the boss is tall, right? And all these things. 
So we get through that in Exodus, boom, and they got it built and they start assembling it. And then here in the beginning of Leviticus, Waikra, um, we have the instruction from Yahweh to Moshe, to Moses, from the Father to Moses, as to here's how you do these offerings. Now we, we built the temple, right? Like we built the arena, here's how you drive the monster trucks, right? <laughs> we built the tabernacle, we have our tent of appointment now, here's how you do the things. And so we find ourselves this morning in Leviticus 7 and 8 where we have the culmination of the explanation about how to do the things. And then uh, we're gonna get into eight, the anointing of Aaron and his sons as the high priests. Now, <clears throat> again, until heaven and earth passes away, it's my supposition, it's my understanding of, of this Bible. Um, and people ask me all the time, well, what do you believe? Man, I believe all of it. I believe the covenants stack, that they don't do away with one another. And that uh, I believe that Yeshua is Messiah and that we believe in him and his, anoint his atoning sacrifice. And that will separate from our separate us from our sins, as far as the east is from the west. And then that allows us to come to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through me, says Messiah. So now we can come to the Father without this burden of guilt, without carrying around these things that they're not ours to carry around anyway. So we can be patched up and, and renewed, right? And here's where, in my opinion, the modern Christian church messes up. They stop there. You plateau at saved. And believe me, salvation is incredible. Without salvation, what's the point? But why salvation? To put a smile on the Father's face. Well, how do you do that? If you love me, keep my commands. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go out into the world. Preach the gospel always. Use words when necessary. Go do. James says, my brethren, be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Go do the things, including these things. Okay? Messiah sums it all up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Most people don't understand. That's Old Testament. That wasn't a new thing that he taught. Both of those can be found in the Old Testament. And you got to do them. Love implies action. You got to go do. Love the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. How? He tells us here. Love your neighbor as yourself. How? He tells us here. So here we are in the beginning of Leviticus where the Father, and you're also going to hear this all the time in the modern church. Well, either A, that was done away with, that was nailed to the cross. Find me the chapter and verse because I can find you dozens that say, no, it's not done away with. Uh, but that requires you to read your own Bible. And B, um, well, we'll come back. We'll come back. Around. Let's just start reading. Sorry, I'll shut up now. Here we are, Leviticus 7. And this is the Torah, the instruction of the guilt offering. It is most set apart, most holy. Holy is sanctified, sanctified is set apart. Okay, that's how the translations work. Literally means set apart, like you keep it separate from. And this is the Torah, the instruction of the guilt offering. It is the most set apart. The guilt offering is slain in the place where they slay the ascending offering, and its blood is sprinkled on the slaughtered place all around. Then he brings from it all of its fat. Where do they slay the ascending offering? Okay, remember they have this, um, this altar. It's, uh, you know, seven and a half foot square, about four foot high. We talked about that in the end of Exodus. Okay, so that's where they slay it. Uh, which other offerings are brought to the door of the tent of appointment and slain there. So this one's slain at the place where you slay the ascending offering, which is at the altar. Okay. Then they, he brings from it, this would be the priest, brings from it all the fat. Now, we've talked about this too, because there's uh, orthodoxy that you don't eat any fat on an animal. But the fat that it's talking about, and it foot stomps this all through here. All of what fat? The fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails. And the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the loins and the appendage on the liver, which he removes with the kidneys. That portion. That portion belongs to Yahweh. That is the fat. If, you gotta, if you're slaughtering a cow and you've got some fat up here, this is where the brisket would be. 
it's not that fat that you're talking about. Like, you don't have to make super dry corned beef anymore, ma. It's okay. Like, it's okay. Pastrami with no fat on it. It's like, great, this is delicious. It feels like shoe leather in the mouth. Orthodoxy. But hey, if they have a conviction to do that, who am I to judge their conviction? But it tells us repeatedly in here, which fat? This fat. And the priest shall burn them on the slaughter place as an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priest eats it. This is the, we're still talking about the guilt offering. So they take that portion, they burn it on the uh, slaughter place as an offering to Yahweh. And then what's left? Every male among the priest eats it. It is eaten in the set apart place. This is inside the tabernacle. It is most set apart. The guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is one Torah, one instruction for them both. The priest who make atonement with it, it is his. So the priest that performs a ceremony, he's going to take this portion back. And the priest who brings anyone's ascending offering, the skin of the ascending offering which he has brought is the priest's, it is his. Okay. And every grain offering that is baked in the oven, and all that is prepared on the stewing pot or on a griddle is the priest who brings it. It is his. So what they're saying is as the priests are receiving these offerings, that portion that he receives, that's, that's his, to feed his family with, to sell that skin at market, to trade for whatever, right? Because they are in service to the Father. So the provision here for them is a portion of this offering, right? And so... The modern, perhaps evangelical interpretation of this, although it's systematized across most, if not all, churches that I've seen, is that the priest, you know, uh, that the tithing and offering, and there is a difference between tithing and offering. Tithing is a portion, I believe it's off the top of your household income, that just goes straight, and it's typically a tenth. So if you make, you know, $2,000 a month, $200 a month is tithed, okay? If you make $10,000 a month, uh, $1,000 a month is tithed, right? 10% off the top. And that would go to um, the storehouse or the temple or the tent of appointment back in the day. However, we don't have those things now. We have the church. So now that tithe goes into the silver lined plate that gets passed around uh, at the, you know, at each. Gosh, I'm going to try not to be cynical. Uh, at each um, message that's given throughout the day. And then that goes into the storehouse of the church. And then there's a disbursement from the church to the pastor in the form of a salary to take care of them. Or in some cases, buy their jets or their cars or whatever. And then you see nowadays there's a movement by pastors to write books to supplement their income. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, on one hand, yay, capitalism. On the other hand, the Father provides. So if there's some, some synthesis in between those two things, okay. But don't write the book to the detriment of your service to your congregation and to the detriment of your service to the Most High. So anyway, I digress. Canada goose. And there's a bunch of cows over there that are hungry. I don't know if you guys can hear them. They'll get theirs. So... The provision here for these priests, what is that? Look at that hair. T's getting old. The provision here for these priests is that. They take that portion back. All right. And every grain offering mixed with oil or dry is for all the sons of Aaron, for all alike. So they split that up. They divvy that up, the grain offering. And this is the Torah of the slaughtering of peace offerings, which is brought to Yahweh. If he brings it for thanksgiving, then he shall bring with the slaughtering of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mixed with oil. Let's talk about that. I don't know if y'all have ever bought matzah in the store. Here's what homemade matzah looks like. Way better. Super simple recipe. You ready? Get your pen out. Six cups flour, six tablespoons olive oil, two tablespoons salt, two cups water, and then have another half a cup on hand. 
whip that all up in a bowl, add a little bit more water until it comes together as a dough. Knead it for a couple of minutes, fold it in on top of itself over our floured surface. Portion that out, cut it into three pieces, and then cut each one of those three pieces into six pieces, so you end up with 18 balls of dough. Put them on a floured surface, roll them out flat, micro thin. How thin? Where'd you go? About that thin. Preheat your oven to 475. Get you a baking pan, put olive oil on it, a good amount of olive oil on it. Take your dough that you rolled out, poke holes in it with a fork so that it doesn't puff up, so it stays thin like a cracker or a wafer. Lay that on the pan, five minutes in the oven, 475. Pull it out, flip it, put it back in the oven for two minutes, total of seven minutes at 475. Put it on a rack, a cooling rack when it comes out of the oven and let it cool for about five minutes. You got matzah. Super simple, very filling, no leavening, great prepper food, delicious, way better than what you get in the store. What you get in the store is kind of like dry, dense, flavorless saltine crackers. They're like big squares that come in a square box. Not good. But if you want some serious unleavened bread, that's how you do it. You can also do this. I don't know if any of you guys are into Cheez-Its out there. Four cups of flour, a cup and a half of shredded cheddar, four tablespoons of olive oil, tablespoon and a half of salt, a cup and a half of water, do, and then do all the things. Do every, the, the rest of it stays the same. Yeah, cheddar matzah, I'm telling you what, it's awesome. So, there's a matzah recipe for you. Unleavened bread, matzah, same thing. See, mixed with oil. Yeah, that's why I told you that. An unleavened thin cakes anointed with oil. Here is an unleavened thin cake anointed. You'd put oil on top of it, which we did as well. Put some homemade pesto on that. Oh, gosh. My wife and her herb garden is tremendous right now. Or cakes of finely blended flour mixed with oil. Also, what's going on here? Beside the cakes, he brings as an offering leavened bread together with the slaughtering of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And from it, he shall bring one cake from each offering as a contribution to Yahweh. So as it comes in, a portion of this, of the unleavened and the leavened, that's going to Yahweh. To the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings, it is his. As for the flesh of the slaughtering of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, it is eaten the same day it is offered. He does not leave any of it until morning. This is just like the Passover lamb. You'd, it better be gone by sunup, okay? And if the slaughtering he brings is a vow or a voluntary offering, it is eaten the same day that he brings his slaughtering. And what is left of it is eaten the next day. So it's okay if, it, you, know, if you bring it on Tuesday and then on Wednesday there's some left, we can eat it on Wednesday as well. However, 17, but whatever is left of the flesh of the slaughtering on the third day is burned with fire. However, if any of the flesh of the slaughtering of his peace offerings is eaten at all on the third day, it is not accepted. Meaning by day three, this carcass of animal that we cooked, it's no good anymore. And this is, again, highly practical. You don't want to eat that. You don't want to eat that. Some leftovers the next day, good to go, not a problem. But on the third day... That's not food anymore. That's biological terrorism. Don't eat that. Okay. It is not reckoned to him who brings it. It is unclean to him, and the being who eats of it bears his crookedness, meaning you will suffer for eating that on, on day three. And the flesh that touches that which is unclean is not eaten. It is burned with fire. And as for the clean flesh, all who are clean eat of it. But the being who eats the flesh of the slaughtering of peace offerings that belongs to Yahweh, while he is unclean, that being should be cut off from his people. So we've talked about clean and unclean before as far as people. Um, and by the way, that whole vision that happens. And thus Yahweh declared uh, all people um, or declared all food clean you realize that that was added in the King James Version. It's in parentheses in my King's James, King James Version. Okay, that's an addition. And that has way more, if you read it in context, that has to do with nations of people 
being clean and unclean, not food. And I get this question all the time. Well, can't the father make anything clean? Yes. Uh, but he also instruct. this is for our instruction. That's what the Torah means, okay? This is for our instruction. This is what you eat. This is what you don't eat. This is how you eat it, so forth and so on. Um, and okay, if we go with the New Testament interpretation of all things are good, well, just because all things are good does not mean all things are expedient. And the example I like to use is, I can walk into your house, go to your furnace, and pull the air filter out and pray over it in the name of Yahweh and have full faith that I can lick that thing and not get sick. Doesn't mean I want to. Because it's good doesn't make it expedient. It's not wise. So, and if you look at the clean eating laws of Leviticus 11, what's removed there, those are the parasitical cul-de-sacs of the different ecosystems that exist there. The pig, things that go forth on paws, um, you know, and fish without scales are all bottom feeders. So you don't eat the bottom feeders because that's where the parasites and the diseases collect. So just like your air filter, that's where the parasite and the diseases collect. So I can pray over it and yeah, can the father, you know, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't make it expedient. And in fact, we're told to do the opposite of here. Till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away from this Torah. That's the words of Messiah, not T. So, and yada, 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 here we go. 21, and when a being who touches that which is unclean of the uncleanness of man or the uncleanness of beast, meaning he's, he's done something for either a man or a beast that's unclean, or of any unclean abomination, and I believe abomination, I've heard a lot of teaching on this, I've done some research, I think abomination in a lot of ways here can refer to fecal matter. Um, yeah, and the, the microbes and bacteria that are found in there which can make human beings very sick. Um, sanitation is key, which is part of why, remember here, there's three to five million people here. It's not just a handful of people. You know, it's not a couple dozen of them. And sanitation, even for a couple dozen people in the wilderness, gets tricky. There's three to five million people here. So a lot of this is sanitation law. And people say, well, yeah, that's because they were in the wilderness. We don't have to do that anymore. For all your generations until heaven and earth passes away. The end. I'm the Lord Yahweh Sabaoth, I change not. Malachi 3.6. If all of this is divinely inspired scripture, which we're told all the time that it is, and I believe that it is, if all of it is, we don't get to cherry pick which verses we can slam together to come up with our own personal theology that makes us feel good about ourselves. It's not about us feeling good about ourselves, it's about us doing the words and the commands of the Father to A, believe on his son's name and have salvation to separate us from our sins as far as the east is from the west, and B, to put a smile on his face by doing his things and therefore, the best words this morning, therefore experience his myriad provisions and blessings. So, yeah, there you go. We're supposed to do these things, including the sanitary things shall eat of the flesh of the slaughtering of peace offerings that belong to Yahweh, that being shall be cut off from his people. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, well, these are just stupid Old Testament laws that come straight from Yah's mouth. Thank you very much. Speak to the children of Israel saying, do not eat any fat of bull or sheep or goat. The fat of a dead body and the fat of that it is torn is used for any purpose, but you do not eat it at all. Okay, so remember we talked about the fat. So he's saying here, don't eat any of the fat, which we talked about, the tail fat and the appendage on the kidney and so forth and so on, of the bull or the sheep or the goat, which is what they were eating, okay? And these are all ruminants, four-chambered stomachs. Leviticus 11, we'll get to that, uh, not today, but soon. But he says here, and the fat of a dead body and the fat of what is torn, this would be an animal that has died or one that was killed by wild animals. That's what it means by torn. You know, it's got tore up is used for any purpose, 
but you do not eat it at all. Meaning, if you want to render the fat for tallow, for a candle, okay, or whatever, or, okay. Use for any purpose, but you do not eat it at all. Roger that. For whoever eats the fat of a beast, which men brings as an offering made by fire to Yahweh, even the being who eats it shall be cut off from his people. That portion belongs to Yah. And you do not eat any blood in any of your dwellings of bird or beast. We've talked about the blood. We've talked about uh, the book of Acts when all these Gentile believers are coming to Messiah and they're like, whoa, this guy's the, he's the way, the truth, the life. I agree. What do we need to do to be saved? How do we get on board? And lest we forget, this is the instruction from the apostles who walked with, Ye with Yeshua here on earth, who walked with him. When they say, what do we have to do? How do we do this thing? Their instruction was, don't fornicate. Don't eat animals that have been strangled. Don't drink blood. And go to the temple on Shabbat and learn the Torah. How do I believe in Messiah? What should I do? I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Hebrew. I'm, I don't do all those Hebrew things. I'm a Gentile. What do I do? Don't fornicate. Don't eat food that's been strangled. Don't drink blood because all three of these things are pagan worship. They're all tied to pagan Id idolatry. And then go to the temple on Shabbat and learn the Torah. Learn the way we do things. We, believers in Messiah, because I and the Father are one, taught Messiah. And the Father, his name's Yahweh, and he gave us an entire book on how to conduct ourselves. I'll also caution you on this. The Jews have just as many, if not more, trappings and doctrines and dogma of men than the Christians do. I'm not particularly interested in what the Jews do. I'm interested in what the Hebrews did and what the Father tells us to do. There's tons of traditions of men in Judaism that have nothing to do with the Bible. Not nothing. We just do it this way because. Okay, well that's the reason I left the Christian church. We just do it this way because. Now, I'm a Christian in the deepest sense of the word. Christian is derived from Christios, which is the Greek meaning to be like Christ. Those people who are trying to be like Christ. I'm trying to be like Christ to the best of my broken ability. I'm not perfect. You know, but don't believe that lie that only one man was righteous. That's a Christian lie. Only one man was ever righteous, brother. Wrong. Read the Old Testament. All the patriarchs are, patriarchs are constantly being found righteous because righteousness literally means to do what the Father tells you to do. If you look at Genesis, the end of Genesis 6 into the beginning of Genesis 7, it talks about Noah did all that the Father commanded him to do and he was righteous. Righteousness is doing all that the Father commands you to do. What does he command you to do? This. So, in a deep obedience to my Messiah, I'm trying to live my life like him to the best of my ability. And in doing that, I've realized he did these things, and he did them perfectly. So, when we're told only one man was without sin, yes, that's correct, because sin... 1 John 3, 4 is transgression of the law. What's the law? It's the Torah. He kept Torah perfectly. Um, you know, I came not to usurp the law, but to fulfill it. Okay, I'm not here to do away with this thing, but to fulfill it. We've talked about this repeatedly. That fulfill, the Greek word there that's used, does not mean, oh, story's over, we fulfilled the law, nailed it to the cross, on to the next thing. No, that word is play ra'u, which means embody. I came to embody the law. I came not to do away with the law, but to embody the law, to show you how to do these things. And to get in between you, Hebrews 8, 6, 8, 8, 8, 10, as the mediator of a renewed covenant between the Father and his people. To walk the walk and talk the talk for you so you can see how to do this, to be your example. So Hebrews 8, 10 you'll have these laws written on your heart because when they're written on your heart, you can't set your Bible down and walk away from them. They live here and you're convicted to do them always until heaven and earth passes away. 
I'll shut up and read more of the Bible now. Sorry. So remember, these came from Yahweh. We go 722. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, do not eat any fat. We did all that, yada, yada, yada. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, 28, speak to the children of Israel saying, he who brings his slaughtering of peace offerings to Yahweh brings his offering to Yahweh from the slaughtering of his peace offerings. With his own hands, he brings the offering made by fire to Yahweh. He brings the fat with the breast to be waved as a wave offering before Yahweh. And the priest shall burn the fat on the slaughter place, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. So that goes to the priesthood for eating. And the right thigh you give to the priest is a contribution from the slaughtering of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron who brings the blood of the peace offerings and the fat, the right thigh is his for a portion. For the breast of the wave offering, the thigh of contribution, I have taken from the children of Israel from the slaughterings of their peace offerings, and I give them to Aaron the priest and his sons as a law forever from the children of Israel. As a law forever from the children of Israel. And I get this all the time too. Well, I'm not a children of Israel. Okay, brief talk on that. Israel was Jacob. Yahweh is the God the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is renamed Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel were Jacob's 12 children. Okay? So out of these 12 tribes, after years in bondage in Mitzrayim, we end up with 3 to 5 million people. Who's the people that Yahweh is speaking through Moshe to right now? Here's how you do these things. They are the tree of life that the Gentiles, the wild branch, is grafted into. That's why this portion that we read each week is called No Roots, No Fruit, because the branch will wither and die without roots. Okay, It has to be grafted into something. Just like we talked about in the book of Acts, you have to be grafted into something in order to be sustained protection, provision, and blessing, okay? What is that something? It's the tree of life. That tree of life is Israel. You're, you are a child of Israel. If you believe in Messiah, if you believe in Yeshua, in Jesus the Christ, you are a child of Israel. I am a child of Israel. This is us, okay? You are grafted into the tree of life. The tree of life is Israel. Not the nation state of Israel, Okay, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother time. But the nation, the people of Israel, who claim the inheritance of the Most High, who can track all the way from the beginning of time to now, their lineage and their relationship with the Creator. That's Israel. You're Israel. I'm Israel. That's us. So when it says we are to do this forever, he's talking to us. Okay. 35. This is the anointed portion for Aaron and the anointed portion for his sons from the offerings made by fire to Yahweh on the day when Moshe presented them to serve as priests to Yahweh, which Yahweh commanded to be given to them by the children of Israel on the day that he anointed them, a law forever throughout their generations. A law forever throughout their generations. We still have generations. Mine are running around here somewhere. And there's older generations right over there across the creek. There's four generations on this property at any one given time. Okay? We still have generations. <clears throat> so, and the other thing to look at here is from 34 to 36, we have the repetition twice. This is a foot stomp. The father's saying, pay attention. Whenever you see repetition like that, two or three times in a short period of time, the father's foot stomping that, making it clear, right? In the mouths of two or three is a thing established. That's Old Testament doctrine. It's right here in this book. Well, he just told us twice in four lines, yo, listen up for all your generations do this. That's actually got me thinking because I have some animals to process. I know what portion I need to bring 
to my pastor because I have animals to process. Good to know. Thirty-seven. This is the Torah of the ascending offering of the grain offering and the sin offering and the guilt offering of the ordinations and the slaughtering of peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moshe on Mount Sinai. This is like the um, oh, they're wrapping it all together at the end of at the end of this chapter. These are the things, right? Which Yahweh commanded Moshe on Mount Sinai on the day when he commanded the children of Israel to bring their offerings to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. That is the end of chapter 7, Waikra 7. Let's hydrate. Love it. Brief, completely unconnected thought. I've been getting skinnier, but I've been doing something really fat with my coffee lately. <laughs> Just putting heavy cream in my coffee. Oh, it's so good. Now, I'll drink instant coffee out of an old boot. I don't care. I'm not a coffee snob. But good coffee with heavy cream in it. OMG. It's really good. Really good. It's the simple things. I'm sitting here on a pallet of cinder blocks, drinking coffee, watching the sun come through the clouds over here, over the top of my hay field. There's do on everything from this rain that we had just this little sun shower this morning gentle breeze i can hear my hens in this barn behind me laying eggs yeah my back hurts so <laughs> you know what i mean it's like one thing out of a million Awesome. All right, let's read Leviticus 8. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering. Now, guys, here's where rubbers meet in the road. We've had all this instruction up to this point. We built the tabernacle, the tent of appointment. We did that. Okay, and we just had lessons on what do you do with it. Now, they do it. It's not just, hey, do all these things. Here's three verses. Can we get that up? Get, yeah, get, go ahead and put that up on the projector. Okay, and then over here, see this verse, this verse, and this verse from three completely different books out of context. If you do these three things, you're going to have a great week. Uh, but listen, um, we got a football game at noon, so let's go ahead. Let's wrap this up. Let's pray. Ah, thank you, God. That's awesome. Let's get one more song, and then let's go. I'll shake your hands at the door. We got to go because, you know, listen, it's Sunday. And uh, we got things to do. No. We have instruction, and then we do them. They're fixing to the do here. Be not just a hearer of the word that they just got from Yahweh through Moshe, but a doer also. Leviticus 8. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation, all <coughs> the congregation, at the door of the tent of appointment. Three to five million people, 600,000 fighting age males, estimated three to five million people. And Moshe did as Yahweh commanded him. And the congregation was assembled at the door of the tent of appointment. And Moshe said to the congregation, This is the word Yahweh commanded to be done. So Moshe brought Aaron, so now they're doing, and his sons, and washed them with water, and put the long shirt on him, and girded him with the girdle, and dressed him in the robe, and put the shoulder garment on him, and girded him with the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, and with it tied the shoulder garment on him and put the breastplate on him, and put the Urim and the Tumim in the breastplate. These are carved stones. This right here, Leviticus 8.8. 8. You should Google that if you have questions. This is, um, 
foundational to the Mormon structure, belief structure. It's right here. It is biblical. And that's all I'm going to say on it. I'm not a Mormon. I don't have anything against those that are. I believe, I, I'm a Hebrew. That's what I do. I do what this book tells me to do. Um, but if you have more questions on that, the Urim and the Tumim, the long and short is nobody really knows what they are. They were carved stones that went in the breastplate. We, we saw that in Exodus, okay? Uh, these are the seer stones, engraved stones. Put the breastplate on him and the Urim and the Tumim in the breastplate and put the turban on his head and on the turban on its front he put the golden plate, the set-apart sign of dedication as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And Moshe took the anointing oil and anointed the dwelling place and all that was in it and set them apart, sanctified them, made them holy. And he sprinkled some of it on the slaughter place seven times and anointed the slaughter place and all its utensils and the basin at its base to set them apart. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to set him apart. And Moshe brought the sons of Aaron and put long shirts on them and girded them with girdles and put turbans on them as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he brought the bowl for the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bowl for the sin offering and it was slain. And Moshe took the blood and put some, of the horn, some on the horns of the slaughter place all around with his finger and cleansed the slaughter place. And he poured the blood at the base of the slaughter place and set it apart to make atonement for it. Atonement is always made with blood. Brit means to cut. The Brit Hadashah is the New Testament in Hebrew. The new cut. Brit, like to cut a deal. There's always blood at a covenant. Our renewed covenant. Renewed, not new, renewed. The concept of a new covenant, which, by the way, is fine if you want to go with new because the covenants stack, they don't replace themselves. But it's renewed. And Hebrews 8.8 8 is a bastardization of the Septuagint, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 33 which clearly states renewed covenant but Hebrews 8 8 especially King James version you got a new covenant so I'll make a new and better covenant with you which most people go see that replaces all the old ones no it doesn't the covenants stack uh, and you should be thankful that they do because if they don't the Adamic covenant guess what you don't get to run roughshod over earth anymore. You have no say, right? Because the covenants replace each other, copy that, so forth and so on. So, yeah. Hmm, there's always blood at a covenant. Brit means to cut. The New Testament is the new cut. Testament's kind of a, a less than ideal word as well because the Greek idea of testament's like a last will and testament. Like, after I die, these are the things that you do for me. Whereas the Hebrew interpretation is this is a living arrangement, a living covenant. We've cut a deal. You do your half, I'll do my half. And so... It's not just that I like that interpretation more, it's that's the accurate interpretation of it. Um, because remember, even though the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic and, you know, Syriac and whatever else you may have, these were Hebrews. They were deeply immersed in the way things were done from a Hebrew perspective. That's what they did. So, okay, moving along. 16 and he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the appendage of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and Moshe burned them on the slaughter place which fat that fat and the bull and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned with fire outside the camp as Yahweh had commanded Moshe and he brought the ram of ascending offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram and it was slain and Moshe sprinkled the blood on the slaughter place all around and he cut the ram into pieces, and Moshe burned the head and the pieces and the fat, 
and he washed the entrails and the legs in water. And Moshe burned the entire ram on the slaughter place. And Moshe burned the entire ram on the slaughter place. Not Aaron, Moshe. All around, and he cut the ram into pieces, and Moshe burned the head and the pieces and the fat, and he washed the entrails and the entire ram in the slaughter place. It was an ascending offering for a sweet fragrance and an offering made by fire to Yahweh, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And he brought a second ram, the ram of ordination, because there's an ordaining going on here. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and it was slain. Now, I don't mean to be graphic here, but I don't know if you've ever drawn a knife across the neck of a living, breathing animal, but there is blood. And it's not a, an easy thing to do. It's very intimate to take a life in that way. There's power in it. I mean, that's part of why the pagans were worshiping that. Things that were strangled. They would strangle because they could feel the lifeblood going out of something and they felt like they were absorbing its power. They would slit necks like that and drink that blood, which is Yahweh's like, you don't do that. No, that is not how we conduct ourselves. They would drink that blood to get the life force from it. Right? And that's why they would fornicate. They'd have these giant orgies for the life force, the power that was in it. You draw a knife across a living creature's neck and hold it, because you're holding it. I mean, you come up, up behind it and you're pulling back and you're holding, you got your legs around it and you're pulling back and you're exposing that vein and you're basically cutting from here, deep, all the way around through the windpipe, all the way around, back up to here. And you're holding while you're doing that and blood is just going everywhere it's spiritual and it's very mindful of you know and this is a Passover thing no that Passover lamb is just a cheap facsimile says me of Yeshua Messiah and his atoning sacrifice but it's also a very powerful prophecy of Yeshua Messiah and his atoning sacrifice. And as I've talked about here before, if I had to go into my front field and kill one of my sheep every time I sinned, it wouldn't be long before I had no sheep, le sheep left, bro. That makes me very mindful. And it's a very powerful thing and I don't mean power in the exercise of authority but I mean it's a very present state emotional spiritual thing to kill something with intent and so when they laid I, I get that when you lay your hands on something I do that I put my hand on the forehead of it and feel it, and you're, you're instilling calmness in the animal. You're letting them know, and they know, they know. They're dumb at a lot of things, but they know. They know when it's their time. So, yeah, there's power in that. And that atoning sacrifice made on that stake by our Messiah, there's infinite power in because it was given freely. And it's that that makes me want to live my life to the best of my broken ability like he did because I don't deserve it. Neither do you. None of us do. But the best way that I can pay homage to that is to not treat it cheaply. To not abuse the grace. To use obedience to the Father and His Son 
to highlight when I need grace and to be really mindful of how I conduct myself. He brought the ram of the ascending offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram and it was slain. And Moshe sprinkled the blood on the slaughter place all around and he cut the ram into pieces. And Moshe burned the head and the pieces and the fat and washed the entrails, brought the second ram of ordination and it was slain. And Moshe took some of its blood and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And he brought near the sons of Aaron, and Moshe put some of the blood on the tips of their right ears, and on the thumb of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moshe sprinkled the blood on the slaughter place all around. And he took the fat, and the fat tail, and all the fat that was on the entrails, and the appendage on the liver, and the two kidneys, and their fat, and the right thigh, and from the basket of unleavened bread that was before Yahweh, he took one unleavened cake, and a cake of bread anointed with oil, and one thin cake, and he put them on the fat on the right thigh, and placed all these in the hands of Aaron, and in the hands of his sons, and waved them as a wave offering before Yahweh. Moshe then took from their hands, and burned them on the slaughter place the, on the ascending offering. They were ordinations for sweet fragrance. It was an offering by fire to Moshe. And Moshe took the breast and waved it, a wave offering before Yahweh. It was Moshe's portion of the ram ordination, as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And Moshe took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the slaughter place and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments and on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he set apart Aaron, his garments and his sons, set apart, sanctified, made holy. Aaron, his garments and his sons. And Moshe said to Aaron and his sons, Cook the flesh at the door of the tent of appointment, and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of ordinations, as I have commanded, saying Aaron and his sons are to eat it. So now they're going to cook up this what's left of the second ram and the bread and eat it. Then burn the rest of the flesh and the bread with fire, and do not go outside the door of the tent of appointment for seven days until the days of your ordination are complete. For he fills your hands for seven days. They will be provided for, for seven days. They're not to leave the tent. And Yahweh has commanded to, to do, and Yahweh has commanded to do, as he has done this day, to make atonement for you. And stay at the door of the tent of appointment day and night for seven days. And you shall guard the duty of Yahweh and not die, for I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the words that Yahweh had commanded by the hand of Moshe. And Aaron and his sons did all the words that Yahweh had commanded by the hands of Moshe. And that is the end of Leviticus 8, but just because, just because. Genesis 6, 22. And Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. And Yahweh said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. And Yahweh said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Leviticus 8:36 And Aaron and his sons did all the words that Yahweh had commanded by the hand of Moshe. There's a pattern here, boys and girls. There's a pattern of expectation here. I'm super thankful 
for the thousand to two thousand views that these videos get each week they are the most meaningful videos that i do and i'm thankful that there are people who have never read their bibles before that read along with these messages and that's how i encourage you to use them to take your bible out and read along with me so that the father might speak to you in his own unique voice for you and convict you in your unique way and while that is one of the greatest blessings that i experience each week is to spend this time with you and to read your comments and your emails and and to fellowship with you digitally i cannot stress enough the importance of you reading your own bible and praying to the father so that you build your <clears throat> relationship with your creator and work on your salvation and have the conviction of your heart to lead your life in such a way that it puts a smile on the face of your creator. I can't be your surrogate in that. I can be your strength and I'll give you cover when all the crazy people out there say, you can't do that, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that. You're not reading the word properly. Well, you know, the cognitive dissonance that comes from when a Christian gets serious about their faith and starts reading their Bible for themselves, you'll very quickly understand the difference between in the world and of the world. And the vast majority of Christians today are both. They're in it, I'm sorry, they're in it, and they're of it. They don't know this word. They've subcontracted the most important thing about our existence to the lowest bidder, to the easiest way for them to check that box every Sunday morning. It's, an attra it's a travesty. So I would encourage you to read your word daily Pray to the Father daily and just ask him to manifest himself in your life in ways that are undeniable. Because I won't be with you on the day of judgment. Messiah will. So I would encourage you to spend far more time with him than you do with me. Spend far more time reading his words than listening to mine. If I can be the example to point you back to the ultimate example of Yeshua Messiah, I'm with that. I'm just a man. I'm just a man doing my broken best to live the calling that the Father has anointed me with. And there are days it's not easy. But every day it's a blessing. So I'm really thankful for you guys being here. I'm thankful that we can do this, that we can spend this time together. Um, always come back to the Father. Do his things. Be found righteous. Yeshua Messiah himself. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. For I do not know you. Master, Master, we've cast out demons in your name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. Law is Torah. He tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you don't know me because you don't know Moshe. If you knew Moshe, you'd know me. Paraphrasing here. The conviction to keep Torah, and this is it, this is the end of this conversation. The conviction to keep Torah is a fruit of the Spirit. One of the named fruits of the Spirit is wisdom and discernment. Wisdom and discernment. It takes both to navigate the lie that is modern Christianity. I read my Bible for myself. I take personal responsibility 
for my relationship with the Father. And I take responsibility for all of the people he's brought to me, my wife, my children, my friends, my family, my tribe, you. And I try and be a steward, a good steward of that responsibility and that faith that he's entrusted in me, he's gifted to me. I don't believe the lies of the modern church. And the more you read the Bible, the less you will too. And you will encounter resistance. And that's okay. Here's why. Because this is a spiritual war. And the idea with Messiah is not to simply absolve you of your sins so that you can lead a good life, whatever a good life looks like. It's to patch you up, to heal your wounds, to cover you, to allow you to separate yourself from the guilt that you rightly bear for all of your transgressions so that you can come to the face of the Father, so that you can seek Him, discern His will for your life, put on His armor, put yourself back on the battlefield of life, and go forth and swing your axe for the kingdom, for His glory, that His will would be done. It's not about you and your good life. It's not about me and my sore back. It's about him. Shalom.